one of the signs that the, your practice is progressing is that you're more and more able to protect yourself from unskillful mind states as they come up. In fact, that's what a lot of the training is, is to give you the tools you need in order to protect yourself. The Buddha gives a teaching that focuses on the power of your action, because that's where your protection is going to come from. And he teaches you to develop qualities like mindfulness and alertness, discernment, to help you see things clearly, to observe yourself more carefully. And he also gives you lines of thinking to get a good perspective on things when the arguments for your greed, aversion, and delusion are coming really strongly. You can have a quick and effective response. That's one of his teachings. He points out an important aspect of learning how to protect yourself is that you have to protect yourself all around. All too often you hear the teaching boiled down to a few short phrases, let go, accept. And there's even though we talk about simplifying your life, there's a way in which you have to make sure that you don't oversimplify the practice, trying to turn it into one activity and nothing else. There's the, the stoop in Wadasokaram, where they have the statues of 28 famous St. John's. In front of each statue is a little phrase. But what was special about that, Ajahn, I remember walking around and really disliking it, the idea that a person's life could be boiled down into a little phrase, Ajahn Sawat gained full awakening while he was walking. I mean, there was so much more to Ajahn Sawat, there was so much more to his teachings than just that one fact. Or that Ajahn Lee had really great powers of concentration. There was a lot more to Ajahn Lee than that. The passages were, and you look in the Dharma talks of the different Ajans, and John Cha talks about one of the points that really struck him when he went to listen to Ajahn Mun. It was when Ajahn Mun was saying that your practice has to be in the shape of a circle, it has to be all around. In other words, you keep at it in every aspect of your life. That's pretty demanding. If the practice were just doing one thing, one thing, one thing over and over and over again, it would be pretty quick, and it wouldn't require that much discernment. But here the discernment lies in keeping your vision all around. There's a, one of the epithets of the Buddha was the all-around eye. He saw things from all angles. He was alert and aware all around himself. And John Mahabhava makes a similar point about being with a John Mun. He'd get very straight arrow in one aspect of his practice, and a John Mun would point out to him that oh, there was something over here that was missing. He'd take on a Tadanga practice, and as he said, there must have been some element of pride in the fact that he was sticking to the practices better than anybody else in the monastery. And so every now and then a John Mun would come, not too often, just enough, slip a little food into his bowl. This broke the practice of not accepting any food that came after his alms round. What could he do? Here was his teacher doing this. He took and reflected on it, realized, okay, there was some pride in it. John Mun was pointing out that fact. So in both of these cases, you know, John Mun exemplifies the, the all-around eye that sees all around, that sees things from all angles. When the Buddha gave instructions to Mahajapati and Gotami, he talked about eight ways in which you can test the Dharma. What's Dharma and what's not Dharma? What's Vinaya and what's not Vinaya? And it's a pretty all-around way of looking at things. It's a good way of protecting yourself on all sides. There are basically three categories. One is you make sure that 
you're in line with the ultimate goal of the practice, which is to unfetter the mind and to lead to dispassion. And you make sure that your practices are good. In other words, you're practicing with contentment. You're practicing shedding, in other words, letting go of your pride. And you're working on making sure that you really do keep up your energy, keep up your effort in the practice. Don't let yourself go slack. And then there are also the, the factors that have to do with how your practice has an impact on other people. In other words, you try to be modest. You're not practicing to become famous or to stand out. You try not to be entangled with people. You don't get involved in a lot of projects that get you involved in the society. Pull you away from the practice. There's a nice passage where they say that the monk who's practicing unentanglement when he has visitors speaks with them just enough so they're content and they go away. In other words, you take care of whatever business there is and you don't string things out. And then finally, you're unburdensome. You try to practice in a way where you're creating as few burdens on other people as possible. So as you notice, this is all around dealing with the goal, dealing with the means to the goal, and also dealing with how your practice has an impact on others, how you relate to others. And so you want to be observant all around. This is how you become more and more your own protector. Because you see dangers from coming from different sides. For example, with contentment, the Buddha says that you see the dangers of getting tied up with your desire for nice clothing, nice food, nice shelter. And you also see the dangers of getting proud over the fact that you are content and other people may not be content. You've got to watch out for that. And that way you protect yourself on all sides. The same with dispassion. That reflection we had on the body right now, that really is great for protecting you from all kinds of things. There was a passage I read once in a Harper's Magazine. A very famous French actor and French actress were having a conversation on the radio. They're talking about seduction. And the actor, who was very handsome, was saying to the actress, who was very beautiful, that the women most the hardest women to seduce are ones who are ugly. They don't take you seriously. You can think about that. If you learn to see your own body as unattractive, then it makes it a lot easier to fend off other people's attraction to you. That's an important protection. Then, of course, the contemplation of the body protects you from your own pride around the body. Because when you're focusing on the body, whose, focus, whose body you're focusing on as you do this analysis, this body of mind, you're focusing on your own body. And people always complain, it gives you a negative body image, but what they're missing is that there's a healthy negative body image and an unhealthy negative body image. And we're working on a healthy one. But the aspects of your body, we're not saying that your eyebrows are ugly and other people have nice eyebrows or whatever. You see, Take apart your human body and you look at the parts that you have in common with everybody else, and there's really nothing there to be worth all the, all the narratives and all the other issues that people create around being attracted to one another or being attracted to yourself. As the Buddha points out, the fact that we're attracted to other people starts out by our ability to be attracted to ourselves. So we've got to take that part apart, and that becomes your protection. Think of that story of the nun going through the woods, and this very eloquent man comes and tries to seduce her, and she sees right through it, and she's not the least bit taken in. And if she were concerned, maybe this person will see that I'm good-looking, or maybe that person will see that I'm good-looking, when you have somebody confirm that you are attractive. If that's the case, then you're you're setting yourself up for people to take advantage of you. 
But if you've given up on the idea of trying to find something attractive in the body, then when other people come, you're not the least bit likely to be taken in. This is a protection. And if you learn to be unburdensome, then when and there will be cases when people try to influence you by with, withdrawing their support. If you learn to be light and able to live with little, that's what the contentment helps with. Then you're better able to resist whatever they're trying to push you into. So these principles here are for your protection on all sides. They have their subtleties, like the principle of contentment doesn't mean that you sit here with a miserable mind and are content with the fact that your mind is in a miserable shape. That's not where the Buddha wants you to be content. He wants you to be content with the fact that, okay, this is the material support you've got, these are the physical surroundings you've got, and as long as they're a place, it's a place where you can practice, okay, you don't get all worked up about trying to make it better here or better there. You keep it clean, keep it neat. But you focus your discontent on the fact that, okay, there's still suffering in the mind. As the Buddha said, the secret to his awakening was he didn't allow himself to rest content with skillful qualities. Even though he had developed powers of jhana, he didn't stay there. He didn't stay right at that spot. He kept trying to use those skillful qualities for something better, to develop things even further. That's where you want to focus your, your desire, your, your sense that there's, got to be, there's something you've got to do. You just can't sit here and accept the situation as it is. This is the part of the situation you've got to change, i.e. the state of your mind. Now, it may take time. And this is why when we talk about putting an effort into the practice, again, the effort has to be just right. The amount that you're capable of attempting right now, given your level of energy, given your level of skill, and what the particular issue calls for. Sometimes some issues require that you do push yourself as much as you can, and others require that you just watch very carefully to figure things out. And so there's lots of room for checking things from different angles. Again, don't oversimplify the practice. Don't try to boil things down to one idea and then just run with that all the way, because you may run off the side of the road. Remember, this is a middle way. It's balanced. And finding balance is one of the most difficult things to do. It requires the most discernment. If, as I've said many times before, if this simply was a practice where you could run off to one extreme, everybody would just run off to the extreme and that would be it. No problems. No real need for discernment. But the discernment lies in figuring out where it's just right right now. And also looking at things from all sides. Is whatever you're doing, is this in line with the goal? Is it in line with the means that the Buddha recommends in terms of shedding and contentment and effort? And what sort of impact does it have on the people around you? To what extent is it getting you entangled with other people? To what extent is it allowing you to find some seclusion? I mean, we're living together here as a group, so we have to interact with one another. But we want to make that interaction stage just at the level of what's necessary to get things done and have a sense of harmony in the group. And beyond that, you don't want it to get in the way. And the same when you go out away from the monastery. You've got to look at your practice from all sides. Keep in mind that the goal of being unfettered is a really noble goal, and it goes against the values of society, so you have to maintain this 
determination that this is what you want. You really do want to free the mind. And wherever it's placing burdens or constraints on itself, you have to check to see, are these in line with the path or are they something that really does get in the way? Because there are some responsibilities you have to take on as part of your path, developing the good qualities you want to develop. So again, don't oversimplify. Remember, this is a path that requires balance. You're training the mind on all sides of the mind. If it were just a matter of training the mind to note, 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 or scan, 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 or whatever the one practice is, it would be like going down to the gym and just developing your biceps. Everything else would be left undeveloped, it would be all out of balance. You're trying to develop all sides of the mind, the discernment in all areas. This is why when you train with the Ajahns in Thailand, everything is part of the training, even how you wash a spittoon, how you wash your bowl. It's all a part of the practice. to learn how to develop the all-around eye. So you can see the impact of your practice in all directions. <laughs>